Thank you so much, Valeria. I think really great points. And um, I've been in preparing for this panel, I've been talking to Valeria a lot more about the experience in Colombia and like all the benefits they've gotten from having a specific focus on um, the subnational level. And it's interesting, like all of the the benefits that she's just highlighted in terms of the ability to be contextual, to adapt to the specific needs at the subnational level, the, this feature of like networking and also this focusing on brevity and, and how to use, how to navigate the standards in their daily work. We've had exactly the same experience um, in other contexts in West Africa and Burkina Faso and Mali. And also we've had the same feedback um, from colleagues in South Sudan where particularly getting to the subnational level is logistically complicated. So I think it's often something that gets left out uh, we have a big national level five day workshop and great, we think we're done. Um, so it's a really great lesson learned from Colombia. So thank you very much for sharing. Gracias. <laughs> Uh, next, I would love to turn uh, to my colleague Ivona Sencio, who's going to tell us a bit about her experience in Peru and particularly how they used uh, the standards around uh, the CPMS uh, in a context of looking at preparedness and climate change. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Susana says, I'm going to uh, share with you the experience that we've had from Peru, in, uh, including the CPMS and the work that we do. In that sense, it's important also to know how, uh, what is the Peruvian context. Peru is a country that faces a different emergencies climate emergencies being one of them, intense rainfalls, floodings, the effects of the El Nino phenomenon, and now El Nino as well. Within this context, Peru registers approximately 7,714 emergencies on a yearly basis, and in that sense, we are a country that is in constant learning, and from that learning, that we are uh, gaining on a yearly basis. This help learning helps us to identify the gaps that uh, are certainly many. And based on the context that we live uh, in, uh, with, uh, in uh, that come with a country that has diverse conditions in diverse regions, there's several numbers uh, belonging to Peru uh, that showed that the main people affected are children and adolescents, that many times through the response that the state provides uh, are not at the core in those actions. They are not directed towards them or targeted towards them. And in 2023, we live the effect of the, of the El Nino phenomenon and the northern part of the country. And due to this El Nino weather patterns, we, our country suffered uh, several different damages. In, in our country, uh, there were 7,000 health centers, 8,000 classrooms, and 200,000 homes were damaged and left inhabitable. Facing that scenario and understanding what was coming for 2024 is when Save the Children developed an intervention based on a strategy of uh, anticipatory actions. These anticipatory actions took into consideration sectorial coordination and was based on protecting uh, children and adolescents. In that same context, what we saw, the importance and the need of just how much could national government, local governments, and at the community level could, uh, could know, identify, and include the CPMS in the response, and that uh, with particular focus on boys and girls. We tra transferred actions to strengthen the national systems, and in those actions we developed workshops with uh, government officials, with uh, officials from the Civil Defense Office, and of um, 
risk management of the Ministry of Education, of the Ministry of Health, in order to uh, raise awareness on the CPMS that in many cases they mentioned that they had absolutely no clue that actually existed. In this, uh, and through these conversations and the analysis that we were able to have with these government officials, led us to reflect on the importance of working jointly uh, and that all uh, sectors could talk amongst and dialogue to be able to include in their action plans the response uh, that would include the CPMS. It's a work that we know that is not going to be done a, uh, overnight, but it is work that has started and it's already starting to bear fruit because we have reports of different government officials that have participated in these workshops where they have been able to uh, do technical meetings where they talk about the CPMS and they uh, also uh, promote them within their spaces and are including them in their conversations and in their technical meetings where they're developing the action plans. That is at the national level. At the local level, we've also been analyzing in the last few days the work that is being done at the local level and with local organizations, the work including municipalities. The work that has been done has been very important. We've not only been able to promote the CPMS, but we've also been able to do a needs-based analysis of those needs that are necessary to be covered in order to truly provide effective response uh, when facing a possible emergency. We focus our uh, uh, participation in three regions, in La Libertad Puri and Lambaweca, and in these three regions, besides developing these trainings on CPMS, we also uh, developed a training of intervention on friendly and friendly spaces, which was one of the needs that had been identified. And this was complemented with the delivery of a preposition kits of safe spaces that needed to be activated during the course of an emergency. Uh, during 2024, we have been able to confirm uh, through communications between uh, received between January and March uh, that the heavy rainfall, uh, uh, the high temperatures caused heavy rainfall and illnesses. Uh, the municipalities where these uh, safe space kits had been placed, 12 of them have already been activated with the support of the municipalities and it saved the children which was present in the area. Within these anticipatory actions, we also pre-positioned uh, feminine hygiene kits. Uh, the, we were, they were placed in a supply store within the region and we prepared the population so that they could identify and uh, recognize when these kits could be, be delivered. These were also uh, promoted to be delivered in an area that may have been uh, that was affected and had been an area that we had already intervened previously and had worked these actions, these anticipatory actions. I would finally uh, mention that we know that we have hard work in promoting uh, and including the CPMS. However, we have seen how sectorial work with go of government-based officers at all levels can cause effective uh, and uh, changes and benefits to girls, boys, and adolescents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. I think it's a really wonderful example, and I really also appreciate it, that you pulled out that in terms of your engagement with national actors, you went from a point of them literally not knowing that the standards existed to actually actively using them and using them as a way that were 
strengthening quality and being able to do like real preparedness for the the floods that you were knew, knew were coming and lovely to hear that that's been activated and you're you're seeing results in the response i think it's a really wonderful case study and it's one um that we don't have that many other examples um, of how the standards have been used in preparedness in this way so peru is a great country to to learn from thank you very much Okay, last but not least, Marina, uh, would you like to tell us um, a little bit uh, about your experience of using the standards uh, in situations of human mobility? Thanks a lot, Susanna, for the question. Thanks a lot for inviting me for this panel. And because it's uh, really the, one of the most important tools that we have working uh, on child protection, the minimum standards, uh, I'm going to focus maybe on uh, standard 14. It's the socio-ecological approach. And I think there you have one of the most powerful images of the entire minimum standards. Some of you, I hope everybody remembers, it's a series of circles and in the very center, you have the child. Let's see if somebody helps me. What's after in the circle? After the child, what do we have? Family, Family? okay. Then if we go a little bit broader, community. community, and then we still have two. What? Which one? Society. Society, okay. The last one is remaining, and I'm going to focus on that one. Anybody remembers? Which one? Okay, it's the the state we can, yeah, it's a good way of interpreting. It's not how it is written on the uh, minimum standards, but it's talking about, uh, I think, social cultural norms and uh, how we use that to focus uh, our response for refugee children uh, within the Venezuela crisis. Uh, you heard throughout these three days that the uh, one of the biggest influx was of uh, Venezuelan children moving across the entire region. Uh, and the work we were doing to strengthen the capacities of the authorities. Most of the time we're focusing on the child protection authorities, but these are not the only ones with, with whom we're working. For instance, uh, UNHCR is focusing a lot on building the capacities of asylum authorities. And so also for them, it's very important that they are using child-friendly procedures when they're doing their refugee status determination. Uh, it's very important that they need to know and they implement uh, interview rooms, for instance, that they are child-friendly. This is something that in the region we are advancing and specifically one of our actions that was in line with our new policy, maybe you heard from, uh, uh, from Jessica, uh, UNHCR recently adopted a new policy um, on child protection. Uh, one of the actions is related to uh, inclusion of children, displaced children, refugee children and stateless children in national systems. And within this policy, we are doing a lot of capacity building for national authorities. Uh, and as I was saying, the showing to them, for instance, how a child-friendly interview room is uh, and learning from the others can help improve the uh, asylum interview. So definitely we were using the minimum standards and the standard 14 to improve uh, this type of service, maybe we not often we think about other types of services. Uh, so in the context of displacement and uh, refugees, we were using the standard to build the capacity and uh, uh, also to make sure that asylum authorities were sufficiently sensitized to ensure that children who have been persecuted and these are the refugee children. So when we are speaking about refugee children, we're speaking about children who are fleeing persecutions. They have the right conditions to tell their story and to be granted asylum. But we were using the minimum standards also on policy advocacy. Uh, most of the time we have child protection services that are very well fit or they are to some extent fit for national children but they don't include refugee and migrant children. 
So in that case, we were using the minimum standards and the policy uh, and policy advocacy we were doing to include this additional uh, group of population that deserves uh, receiving uh, child-friendly services. So these were a couple of examples. What were the results? So this is how we used it. A couple of examples, again, capacity building and advocacy. The results we saw by using the, uh, the minimum standards were basically three main results. They are not the only one, but for the sake of brevity, I'm going to focus on these three. We saw improved national systems. So we saw that when using uh, the minimum standards in general, and specifically this one, to build the capacities and to do advocacy, we were seeing that some of the uh, response services were actually uh, improving the way they are serving refugee and migrant children. So all children, but also refugee and migrant children. And also this uh, also facilitated the safe and non-discriminatory access to the different uh, services. And specifically, let me make, uh, let me highlight the importance of birth registration and civil registration and the impact it has on displaced population. A child, a refugee child without document cannot even go to the hospital and that's a problem so that's why improving the national systems and specifically improving the uh, birth registration and civil registration was crucial the la last two points were, are related to sustainability if we invest in national systems we ensure a longer term protection for refugee and migrant children uh, also after the immediate uh, impact of the crisis. And the last point is about uh, local ownership. Most of the time, the UN come to, uh, to a, a new country or we have international organizations uh, that are coming when there is a crisis. But the most important is that we are empowering and we are supporting the national authorities uh, to create a sense of ownership. This is their country, they need to take the lead on the response and making sure that the uh, child protection systems are strengthened and the infrastructure is going to stay for the future and for the benefit of all children and including refugee and migrant children. So thanks a lot for your time. Thank you so much, Marina. I, it's a really wonderful example, and I, especially to hear how the standards have been used for advocacy and how that's then borne fruit uh, for the response, I think is a really inspiring one. And, and I recall when we went through a very long and intensive process to revise the standards and improve um, the focus on inclusion and support for um, refugee children and other children displaced and uh, children on the move. Um, this, this was part of the intention that, that they be there and be something that could be used as a tool. And so it's really, really lovely to have an example um, of how that's been done in the region. This is our. This was our short panel for you. Um, some really inspiring examples um, from the region. Of great work that um, is not finished, is ongoing, is a continued commitment. But we see how um, the standards are are working through different tools. We're gonna shift into a group activity where you can exchange some of your own experiences. And I'm just gonna hand over to Joanna. Hello again. Unfortunately, we're tight on time. We were only given an hour for the presentation and the panel. We are going to ask you to choose a group to go into. We have six groups, three topics. So each topic, there is an English group and there is a Spanish speaking group. So the first group is looking at the CPMS and support to refugees and migrants. And that's going to be led by Marina. Uh, the second group is uh, in Spanish. The second group is um, the same topic, CPMS and support to refugees and migrants led by Susana. The third group is the child protection minimum standards and support to national and local actors. That will be led in Spanish by Valeria, Valeria, sorry, um, and in English by Yvonne. Put up your hand, Yvonne, yep. 
And then the final two are the CPMS and climate change, which will be led in Spanish by Neri and in English by myself. So each of those facilitators have a few questions that we would like you to consider in your groups and we'll be taking notes in your group. Unfortunately, we won't have time for a plenary, but Susanna and myself and the working group here in the region are very much looking forward to gathering your feedback and seeing how we can best move these forward. So if we could ask you to move to the facilitator and the group that interests you the most, and we'll get the process started. Unfortunately, that is the end of our time. <laughs> Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you to our panelists. We will come around and collect the notes that you've taken. And we obviously want to stay in touch if you have further ideas you'd like to explore with us. Thanks very much, everybody. We really appreciate it. You can see our email address up on the slide if you would like to be in touch. Um, I just made the joke to our colleagues uh, in my group that we do actually answer our emails. So you're very welcome to be in touch. Um, you can see the QR codes for our working group website if you'd like to scan them, if there are any resources you want to explore. Otherwise, come and find us. Um, you know, we're here for a few more hours. Mm -hmm.